Okay, so with uh, Dr. McLean, Stuart McLean, um, we went to university together, dental school together. Um, yeah. Stuart was, uh, was um, one of the top students, winning awards. Um, I'm sure you'll tell us a bit about that later on. I think, Stuart, you, you've always been big on traveling, haven't you? Bit of a backpacker. Yeah, well, I tried to do as much um, around uni because you seem to graph for eight months and yeah. then you've got three months off, so you might as well try and do something with it. <laughs> the bad thing about it is you've got no money, so that's why you have to go backpacking and go to Southeast Asia where it's all cheap. All right. And um, I think what um, we want to really talk about later on is you you are a dental core trainee um, yeah. it's competitive to get into um it's yeah. a different path to what i took i ended up being in general practice but stuart went straight to the hospital after foundation training so he's going to be telling us what that's like um what he's learned and what he's learning as a dental core trainee um but i gotta ask you that question why did you decide to become a dentist it's so difficult, isn't it? I can't pinpoint a thing and say, oh, it's because of this. I think just going through my education, I used to quite like getting my hands dirty, if you will. So I always used to like sort of the technology sort of stuff and building things. And then I was the smartish, so I quite enjoyed the biology, chemistry and that side of it. Yeah. So I was just torn between medicine and dentistry. And at the time when I went and did my work experience, I did it at Preston Hospital actually. Yeah. Um, and then in dental practice, I just found dentistry more interesting than medicine. When I was shadowing medics, it just seemed less hands-on. Whereas what I quite liked with dentistry was the academic side, but as well as sort of the practical side as well. You get to stuck in, get stuck in and use... Did you have any, anybody in the family that was in dentistry? No. no, there's absolutely no one in my family, even in healthcare, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and no one's even followed that track. My, one of my brothers is an architect and another one's doing conservation and ecology. So that's probably yeah. the closer. But my dad was a mechanic and my mum was a teacher. So God yeah. knows how I ended up being a dentist, really. So what was that like trying to get into dentistry? Like, how, I found how it, was that journey? I found it quite difficult. Um, I applied it from A-levels, mm -hmm. but I didn't get the grades because mainly I, with hindsight, just messed about and just sort of expected to get three A's rather than working for them. Yeah. So from that, went on, um, did a, a BSc in medicinal chemistry. And then I sort of, after a couple of years of that, I thought, man, my pathway will be this. But then when I got into my third year, I really didn't enjoy it and couldn't enjoy it, like see a career in chemistry. So look back at dentistry and thankfully I went down a postgrad route because I had enough biology and uh, uh, elements in my sort of uh, chemistry degree. So, um, so you, you applied, didn't get in um, because yeah, of the grade. Was, so at A-levels, yeah, I held a spot and then obviously it's a conditional offer on the three A's. Didn't get my three eights, so obviously that was rejected. Um, did, did you did you almost like give up on dentistry or put it to the side when you went into medicinal yeah. chem? Yeah, so I kind of put it on the back burner and sent because I appreciated how difficult it is to get onto dentistry straight from A levels. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, I'll give it a go, and then if I don't get on, I'll just go and pursue chemistry because I quite enjoyed like chemical, not chemical engineering, but uh, pharmaceutical design and things like that. And I quite okay. enjoyed chemistry levels. So I thought, you know what, if I don't get in, that could be a reasonable career path to go down. Quite interesting. Do you think about, about maybe taking a gap year? Um, at the time, no. I was just quite focused on going, you know what, I'm just going to go and go straight into uni. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with dentistry, like, if you don't get your grades within that two years, then they don't accept you if you reset. So from that side of it, I was just like, I could have a gap year, take some time out, I could reset my exams, but ultimately that sort of getting in dentistry from that point of view was, was over really. Cause I think there's only two dental schools at the time that would accept reset grades. Okay. So I kind of just said to myself, um, no, go and go to uni and, and go and do this other degree, which I'm glad I did, frankly. All right. And then when you applied after or during medicinal chemistry, did you 
apply to just the one dental school or? So um, I applied to UConn, I applied for all the post-grad ones. So UConn, Aberdeen, Liverpool, and either Kings or Plymouth. I can't remember, I think it was Plymouth. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied for all the post-grad ones. Um, mm -hmm. And the only one I even got an interview at was at UConn. And thankfully I got in. All right. Good. Okay. And um, all right. So then dental school started. Like yeah. what were some of your highlights from that? What were some of the struggles so, in dental school? Well, from an academic sort of dental school point of view, it's hard. I don't think sort of the stuff that you need to learn, you have to learn it in a reasonable detail. Mm. But in terms of depth of knowledge, I don't think it was as much compared to my previous degree. Um, but it's just the breadth of knowledge. You just need to learn loads of stuff about loads of different areas of dentistry. Um, so your breadth of knowledge has to be quite good, um, which I found quite difficult. Um, then the enjoyable sort of academic side of it from our dental school is that we got sort of stuck in straight away. So you're marrying what you learn straight in with uh, patients and clinics. Yeah. So it was enjoyable and it got you through because the practical side in dentistry is the thing that you look forward to. The sort of academic lectures is the stuff you don't. So there's a good yeah. mix of that in dental school. Um, and then the other side of it from a personal point of view, um, it was, I think we were quite lucky in our year. Um, we all got on really, really well. Yeah. We had lots of sort of social stuff with uh, nights out, meals, etc. And then at our particular dental school in UConn, you get split up into uh, four groups of eight. Um, and our group of eight was, was a really good one. We all got on really well. We're actually quite close friends and we stayed close friends afterwards. So yeah. from a social what side. What talking? Was... <laughs> yeah, I know. What we're yeah. That, that, that's good. So, um, I mean, d did you get some sort of confirmation that, you know what, dentistry was the right choice during uni, or would you say it was after uni? That you um, well, it's been both, really. I think definitely at uni, because I always judge it on, it sounds a bit daft, but when you sort of get up in the morning, you can be like, right, I'm actually looking forward to going to, to the uni. Um, and the thing that I quite liked, as I alluded to, when we were talking about applying to dentistry, I quite like the practical side of it. Mm -hmm. And when you do something, uh, dentistry is quite an instant self, almost like gratification sort of. You can look at something and look straight away and go, yeah, yeah. that's good. I've done a good job. And it gives you a sort of that self-confidence and self-belief. So yeah. that happened at, at uni and it's continued since because yeah. if I looked back now at some of the work I did at uni, I don't think I'd be going, oh, that's really good. So you're always progressing. Hey. So the, the work Stuart was doing at uni is better than the work I'm doing now. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, like when we're at uni, um, looking back, I think you know when I saw the work that you were doing, I thought it was it was really good. Um, how? What do you think helped you to to be as good as you were at uni? Well, I thought it was really good at that stage, anyway. Um, do you think it was any skill from before university or during? Um, what would you put it down to? I don't know. Appreciate. Firstly, thanks. I don't know if I agree with you because we're all sort of critical at our own work. But thanks anyway, Arnie. I appreciate you. Um, I don't know. I think for myself, it's in my mind. I always have something that I tried to sort of aim for so in dentistry obviously it's almost like not sculpting but you've got a picture of what it should look like so I try and aim for that and then I know if it's my work's not as good as what I want it to be I just can almost repeat stuff so I'd spend a bit of extra time in phantom head sessions or try and basically just put in a little bit of extra time to see if I can sort of improve it and compare it to what I have in my mind in terms of any sort of pre-dental school skills I don't think so. I didn't have any, when you go to dental schools, you always ask for like dexterity and stuff like that, but I didn't play any instruments. I didn't do any art or anything like yeah. that. I don't know. I think maybe, I feel I do pick up practical skills quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way I sort of learn is quite visually orientated. So that might play a part in that sense. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't really know, frankly. I think just to put in a, maybe a tiny little bit of effort in and being fortunate in the way I learn in terms of visually and watching other people. I think it's a, it's a good time as well just 
for the dental students watching. Um, so the, the Royal College um, of Edinburgh, the award that you won at, at, well, at UCLan first and then you were entered um, to go to Edinburgh. So just yeah. how did that come about, you know? So the, um, it was a Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, and they ran a clinical skills sort of competition. Um, it's almost like an, an OSCE. Um, it was for final year students only and it was run across all the dental schools and we were asked to do a crown preparation of an upper three in an hour or so on plastic teeth. So quickly do that. You're going to have to, like, to, 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 to really, you know, make that more basic for some of us who are not in the dental. So um, it's almost like for teeth, you have to put a cap on the top of it for some teeth. And the way that you do that is prepare it by taking a few millimetres off the front, the back and the sides. Um, and that's what you've got to do. It's a reasonably exacting procedure in the sense of you are working in only sort of differences of 0.1 millimetres sometimes. Yeah. And you've got to go between teeth. So there's always risk of damaging teeth. So it's a reasonably difficult procedure in terms of your skills. Mm. Um, so all the final year dental students who wanted to participate did that. And then it was judged by um, two people from our dental school and um, an independent is all sort of privately judged. And from that, I got the top score. So I managed to win, obviously, our little dental school one. Um, and then from that, all the dental schools put someone forward, obviously the winners, and they went up to Edinburgh and basically competed in a... Uh, for the dental students and OSCE, but for the sort of non-dentists, it's almost like a number of different practical stations. So it varied from um, discussing treatment options with um, a patient or placing a dental implant or something really van random. So we had to use a laparoscopy machine. I hope I pronounced that right. But um, it's like the arthroscopy machine. So mm. every time you went forward, it was actually going back. And when you went up, it went down left and right. So it was all really disorientating. And you had to stack sh sugar cubes on top of each other. All right. And then from that, you get scored. And then there was a sort of a ranking thing at the end. So, so that was that. It was, it was interesting. Though. It was a good experience. Would you say that that helped you in any way going forward? Um, yeah. So I think from a practical point of view, it, stuff like that's always really good in applications one it's it's a bit of um you can start talking about that because it's an easy thing to talk about an experience and it gets almost the conversation flowing particularly in a uh, competitive interview um which i'm sure me and arnie will touch on in dental core training um it also helps when for foundation dentists which is the the first year it was something i managed to talk about with uh, the different dentists at the time so from that side of it it's a I think it was good to almost start the conversation with dentists. Um, and additionally, it just, it potentially just makes stand you apart from the, the other dentists that you're basically applying for a job. It potentially just makes you a little bit different. Obviously everyone puts a different emphasis on things. Um, but from my experience, it's, well, what I like to think is that it may just set me apart from the other 100, 200 dentists who, yeah. who are out there. Definitely. So uh, before we leave dental school, uh, what would you say were some things that you would have liked to know before dental school or what would have helped you get through dental school? Um, get through dental school? Yeah. Um, the first one's graft. You've got to actually work really hard because like I mentioned before, if you kind of assume that you're going to get the grades, you're not. You're going to fail and it's not like college it's not like school there's there's an element of support but there's an element of self-directed learning as well and if you don't commit putting the hours after uni putting the hours during uni then you are going to struggle and you'll drop off quite quickly and the thing with a vocational degree like dentistry is that if you don't have the knowledge then when you start to treat patients it becomes apparent and patients pick up on that you don't know stuff and then it's a sort of cascade of trust etc yeah. so the main thing is the graft side of it really mm -hmm. um both academically and practically as well um I'm trying to think of anything else in terms of just getting in or during dental school uh, during dental school what would help help you get through it in a better way or yeah so there's that there's the graft side of it but then the other side of it's the ability to properly switch off because you need time where you can just let everything rest and not stress about it. Um, I think I'm reasonably chilled, but I would find myself worrying about random stuff on a Saturday night when I shouldn't. 
So for people out there who are a little bit worry about things a little bit more than I, you definitely will worry at dental school. So you need to almost have a mechanism in place, like support groups, family, friends, or have a hobby where you can just take yourself out of dental school and the stresses of it for a, a weekend a week and, and you can come back with a fresh mind and mindset. And I think it's sort of really important that side of it as well. Yeah. All right. And then after dental school, um, we all went into foundation training. Um, yeah. So yeah, just, 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 just talk a little bit about how that experience was for you. Starting. So it's really good experience. So I went um, to the North Manchester scheme, um, which I really, really, really enjoyed. It was in quite a high needs dental area, so basically lots of people with lots of bad teeth. Now I think that's a really good place to learn because you get stuck in straight away. So straight in, you've got loads to do, and it's a case of just almost cracking on. It's there's not an expectation. Well, there's always expectation from your patients, but there's less of an expectation, I think, than going to a place that's kind of reasonably affluent and the, the patients expect a little bit more. Mm. Um, and there's a whole range of treatments available as well. You go from uh, taking teeth out to doing root canals. You've got crowns, bridges, dentures. You're doing the whole breadth of work that you've learned at uh, dental school and again with some of the practice and definitely some of my colleagues at the time working in slightly nicer leafy suburbs yeah. that availability of treatment was was less so than i had um so that's do, you, do, you, do you think do you think um there was much of a difference on what type of practice you ended up at doing your foundation training like i'm thinking of yeah. somebody who's thinking of picking an area um is there yeah, so, you're looking out for is it is it important to specify one area over another or is it just, it's the area I'd like to live in for a year? No. Yeah, I is think difference? you can stay here and say, oh, you should go somewhere because of this practice and things like that. But you, it, there's too many variables, I think, because you could go, oh, I want to go to this place and work in this practice. But mm -hmm. in terms of ranking, and it's almost like doubly ranked in the sense that you need to get into that scheme first and then, if you rank well, then you have to get the practice. So I would. But the scheme gives you the region. Yeah. Exactly. And once you get the region, you need to rank for a particular practice within that region. Yeah, exactly. So it's, there's a lot of variables. So my main thing would just base it on geography, really. I think there's a variance in experiences of individual practices, but when you speak to people about regions generally, everyone in different regions has a fairly similar experience in terms of the education and things um, in terms of picking a particular practice my advice would be to go go to a area of higher need okay uh, that's why i think i think there's more patience to do stuff there's a less of an expectation to do things well quickly um perhaps like i mentioned with some of the sort of slightly more affluent areas um why is that important though having that opportunity to do a because ultimately treatment? because you've just come out of dental school so there's that element of um for lots of dental schools it's completely different because you're going from an area that's heavily supervised into an area where you're practicing on your own and you're taking all the different for the majority of students and taking all they've learned from restorative clinics oral surgery clinics and combining it all together so to be able, being able to do that on patients with a lot of different need, I think helps you speed up that process of becoming a general dentist. You can start to pick the stuff that you learned from the restorative clinics, oral surgery, et cetera, and start to mold it all together. Yeah. And you can do comprehensive treatment plans. You can do perio and then stabilization, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and take them from, a, from someone who needs a lot of work to all the way to the finish. I think sometimes in basically in areas where people look after the teeth a bit more, it's the occasional fill in, the occasional um, crown, the occasional bridge. It's less comprehensive treatment, I think, anyway. I think you don't get that sort of um, freedom where there's no time constraints, no other pressures. You just got to focus on getting a person from point A to point B. You can have them in for as many appointments for as long yeah. as you want. There's no outside pressure. Um, I mean, I think that that makes it a good environment to really learn and own your craft. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a perfect stepping stone to come out of practice, I think. 
um, definitely into a sort of higher needs area and you can start basically putting into practice everything that you've learned. Yeah. So at this point, did you know what the next step was? So then um, was one year, did you already have it mapped out? Sorry, not the uh, foundation year was one year. Did you already yeah. have it mapped out that you were going to go into dental core training? No, I was quite on the fence the last minute, to be honest. However, um, what I tend to do in situations where I don't really know what my next career step is going to be, I tend to ask more senior people. So I, I stayed reasonably close with um, some of the clinicians from the dental school, mm. and they all basically said do dental core training. So from that, I took their advice. Um, they sort of said you'll get more benefit because ultimately – you can work as long as you want in a practice. It's actually very difficult to go back into a hospital setting um, if you're three, four, five years down the line. So they all advise the amount of extra skills that you pick up, a different environment, a different experience in the long term will definitely be more beneficial. So mm. I, I've always really seen nice. dental core training as that's the step that you're taking because you want to specialise. Would you, would you say there's more to it than that? I personally would. It's definitely a logical thing to do, and I'm sure we'll cover on how to get into specialist training um, and how dental core training uh, sort of correlates to that. But um, with dental core training, I don't think it needs to be people just who want to specialise. I think what it gives you is a broader range and understanding of, of dentistry. Um, there's lots of different posts available. You can work in district general hospitals in the max fat unit or go to different dental specialities. And what it gives you is a, a, a better rounding of dentistry, I think, because mm -hmm. you get a better understanding as a general dentist, where your referral goes, how it's managed. And I think if your intention is always to go back into practice, you're armed with that knowledge now. I'm thinking, right, I'm going to refer this person to a max fat unit this is how long it's going to take this is how long they're going to wait and this is the treatment so i think it's definitely more beneficial for your patients so what, what was the process like trying to get in because I, I hear it's quite competitive yeah it it is reasonably competitive it's also it's just stressful because it's um, a competitive application so um basically what that is is for dental core training you're ranked on it's the same for foundation uh, training. So you have a situational judgment test and then you go to recruitment centers and they ask you about professionalism, communication skills. And then from that, you get a mark for each one. And then you, that mark is compared to everyone else in the country who's applied. And from that, you're either, we're well, not allocated, but you rank the post that you want to do. And if you rank well enough, you'll get one of your posts. Uh, but in dental core training, I don't know the exact numbers, but there's more applicants than there are places. So mm. unfortunately, if you don't rank well enough, you won't get a post in, is when it comes to posts that people quite want. Mm. A lot of posts that people want, I think you kind of alluded to, a lot of people already know that they want to specialise. So they'll start to go in for particular posts. For example, a 12-month paediatric dentistry post at one of the dental hospitals is going to be more competitive than a MaxFax post at a district general hospital. So that's the competitive nature of it. Okay. So would you yeah. say the process was very different to applying from foundation? So applying from um, final year to your dental foundation training and then applying from dental foundation training to dental core training. Was there much no. of a difference between the two? Not really. For... Um from foundation training to dental core training, it's pretty similar. The situational judgment test is the professionalism and there's communication skills. So from that side of it, it's it's pretty similar, frankly. Um, Was your preparation the same? Yeah. Um, I, again, there's probably more support going into dental foundation training because we had support from our um from our dental school and um, I'm sure that'll be a case in lots of dental schools across the country. Um, whereas when applying for dental core training, it's a bit more isolated. And then like you said, um, me and Arnie went on separate paths. So you don't have the opportunity to draw on what are you realizing for this Arnie, et cetera. Whereas in dental foundation training, we're sort of all in it together. Mm. So we all kind of help each other out. But when we all start to go on your separate paths, you get a bit more, you have to, do it on your own a bit more 
but in, there's lots of private courses out there that help you prepare and give you the information etc so it's not that hard to find a little bit of additional support um to have you any them. of them yeah so i went on by um dental training consultants um yeah was that for the for dental foundation training Part. Yeah, yeah, it's the same one. They do a foundation training and then they do a dental core training one as well. And fundamentally, what that is, is just like a mock day of how it will be. Um, by, I think it was run by dental core trainees. So they can sort of, I think that's quite good because they give you experience of what it's like and they've been through it themselves. Um, and that just helps you to change your mindset on how to answer things. Um, you do that one as well for, for um, DCT? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, when I decided, yeah, I want to do dental core training, like I said, there's books out there and things to revise, but sometimes when you're doing it on your own without like a, a scaffold of how to do it, it's good just to get some someone else's opinion or someone else who's been through it. And at that time, I didn't know anyone particularly who I could say, oh, what do you need to do for dental core training? So I went through that training course. Okay. But there's loads of Starting a dental core training, like, what was that like? Um, what well, was the first I, day like? What was the first week like? What, what, how was it? So for, me, for me, it was really strange because um, at Yukon Dental School, we're trained completely different to every other dental school in the country in the sense that it's very primary care focused. And what I mean by that is that you're prepared to be a general dentist and sit in the practices at the top of the high street. Um, in my dental core training year, I went to Liverpool Dental Hospital. And did a mixed speciality job so basically I did all the different dental specialities um, lots of people might be listening to this they were trained in traditional dental schools and it's all very separated and um, departmentalized so for me it was strange because I'd gone to the department and you just have consultation clinics yeah so I found it strange to be like oh are we gonna go and do this now and then the consultants was looking at me like no I will come back in <laughs> I don't know, in months and have it done yeah. Um, but it was different and weird and a little bit overwhelming for the first yeah. week or so and then after that it was fine frankly there's a reasonable amount of support from the, the seniors the nurses and also your colleagues so mm -hmm. it's almost like a sense of we're all in it together yeah. um, sort of thing, which is all right what, 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 what were some highlights of that year your first year of dental core training so um, for me what I quite like was getting involved in the slightly um, more advanced stuff. Um, so I've got an interest in sort of restorative dentistry. So I've seen some advanced tooth wear cases that I didn't feel confident in doing in foundation training, yeah. seeing them under the supervision of consultants who do them day in, day out, um, and actually getting to practice some skills and understand some concepts is one of the highlights for me. And then the other side of it is, I had um, exposure to dental specialities that I didn't at undergrad. Sorry, obviously, a postgrad at so special care dentistry. You see patients who actually really need your help with complex medical histories, and you take them through diagnosis and treatment. And from that side of it, you don't really see those patients in general dentistry because they're either seen in a community dentistry setting or in a dental hospital setting. Yeah. So I suppose the overarching thing is seeing the different stuff that you wouldn't see in general dentistry because it's probably no longer general dentistry. It requires slightly more specialist yeah. care. So what, what, what seemed um, difficult when you started dental core training, but by the end of it, you didn't find it difficult anymore? Um, I suppose the stuff that I originally found difficult is maybe the knowledge based stuff because stuff that gets referred in is if general dentists are either struggling with the treatment or don't feel confident in doing the treatment so then being referred something in to myself who frankly probably doesn't have enough the same amount of experience as a, a dentist who's been qualified 30 years and referring in it's it's picking up that different knowledge gap that you don't have particularly in things like restorative dentistry and oral surgery where frankly you don't have the experience yet so at the beginning of the year you'd see like a impacted lower wisdom tooth on the oral surgery department and then you'd just be like well i've got no idea how this is going to come out yeah and then by the end of it you can then think right look at the x-ray and think right this is 
angled measly, it's close to the nerve, we need to take it out this way, this way, and this way. Yeah. So you just feel you you only notice that your skills and knowledge have improved when you reflect a year later. Yeah. So on that side of it, you go in not knowing as much, but it's because of your lack of experience. And by the end of it, you've experienced a reasonable amount and you feel more definitely more confident. That's it. So basically the things that um, general dentists like myself struggle with, we send it into people like Stuart to take a look and to take over. So that's why Stuart's always on my speed dial when I'm in a tricky situation. Yeah, again, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, you did one year of dental core training. Yeah. And, and um, it takes us into the second year now that you're currently in. So yeah, yeah. what was the... Did you have to do a second year? Is it just as simple as you carry on into the second year? But how, how does that? Okay, so um, on the dental core training pathway, um, there's three years, DCT one, two, and three. Okay. As you go up, think of it as a pyramid. As you go up, the pyramid does less and less places okay. um, because the amount of posts are less. Um, so you start to step up and then it's up to you. You can jump off at any point if you think, I'll do a DCT one job. I enjoy it. I don't enjoy it. I'm done. I'll go back to general practice. Mm-hmm. You can go into dental school training and uh, dental school training two and three. Um, and each year has got an interview because you need to rank every year. The only difference in the interview process is that at DCT two and three, you have the introduction of a, a portfolio. So a professional portfolio that looks at um, basically your professional development um, and takes into account all the things that you've done, things like audits, um, exams, uh, awards, etc., etc., And that gives up to 25% of your mark. So that's the main difference. Um, so, I to just that a little bit. so to be competitive, you now need to start having this portfolio. Um, yeah. So yeah, t- tell us what a good portfolio looks like. So you've, done, like, you, you've done DCT one. Yeah. And um, you're now going into DCT. Actually, no. Why would you even want to go into DCT two and three? And then so it, after that, what, what, what would make you more competitive? Yeah. yeah, that's fair. So I think lots of people want to go into DCT one. So from one to two, the three is one, they kind of know they want to specialize. And uh, probably at this point, if you want to specialize in anything in dentistry, you need to have DCT one and two. Okay. That's it. You don't have to do DCT three, but you have to do one and two. Um, you don't have to, but it's pretty much a given that everyone applying has done one and two. Okay. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, on my thought process was based on that. It's still in DCT one. I wasn't convinced about doing specialist training. So I thought I'll go and do DCT two as well. Cause then at least I don't shoot myself in the foot in the future. Um, if I do decide to do specialist training, at least I can come back to it. Mm-hmm. The other thing is the, the posts that you do. Um, in my first year, I was reasonably fortunate and did a dental hospital post, which I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a whole range of, of posts, as I've alluded to before. What, what lots of people get, the majority of the posts are MaxFax or District General Hospital posts. The MaxFax head and neck uh, doctors, yeah. they're the majority of posts. Them posts are quite intense, depending on where you get them. So lots of people almost do the 12 months in a MaxFax post and decide, actually I want to try and get into a dental hospital post yeah. and then that's why they're applying to dental core training. Another way is that if they, lots of people do a, for lack of regional unit, the max fax unit, it can be quite quiet in terms of a big head and neck unit. The one around here is like Aintree Hospital. Okay. So some people who've got an interest in max fax might want to go from a quieter max fax unit into a really busier one. So ultimately, Lots of people go into dental core training two and three to experience a different post and a different environment or because they ultimately kind of have to to get onto their specialist training. And then there's probably the, a, a little bunch of people in the middle who just want to continue to add to their experience. As I mentioned before, it's an opportunity in your career that you probably won't have again to just experience different sides of dentistry and, and I suppose medicine in the sense of Max Fax. Okay. So now, you know, doing DCT two, what would you say you've um, you, you, you've been learning that you didn't quite get from DCT one personally? So, so my DCT two job was in a max fax unit in the Wirral. Um, the reason I picked that as is because I did a dental hospital post. Um, so this max fax job 
the experience I got is surgical experience in uh, that we did we didn't do a huge amount of head and neck cancers like the big reception stuff we did skin cancers um osteotomies this is basically for orthodontics where you change the relationship of the jaws yeah. um, excision of cysts a lot of like surgical based stuff which is just interesting to watch particularly when you start to assist on it and by the end of the six months um i started to actually do some of the more simple skin stuff so like a simple bcc on someone's head yeah, i would do that surgery. Yes, yeah, so, which is just a fun thing to do, I think, which is maybe a bit so silly. What's that? What, what's that? A BCC? Um... So, a lot, a BCC is just a little skin cancer, um, a non-invasive one, but needs to go. So you mm -hmm. usually get them on lots of um, elderly people's scalps and things. Okay. So it's usually a little bit, and you've got to take a safety margin of skin around and put a little skin graft on. Now you watch them and assist. So, so you're, 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 you're pretty much cutting a bit yeah. of skin from someone's scalp. Yeah, exactly. Now, that together. Yeah, okay. basically. Now, some people might be listening to this and thinking, not a chance, <laughs> which is fair enough. But at the time, I thought yeah, it'd be quite interesting to do and quite interesting to see. Yeah. So that's why. What were some interesting them. cases that you saw? Maybe A and E, or you know. Yeah. So the A, the A and E stuff. You, as part of a max factor unit and probably the stuff that you're doing the most is managing the immediate emergency sort of stuff that comes into A&E. So you see loads of big facial swellings. So my, not to belittle you or anything on it, but my big facial swelling will start to be a lot different to Arnold's potentially, just because of what we see. When people get to hospital with a tooth swelling, it's massive. Yeah. So that's what- The swelling that we deal with is not as life-threatening as when they get to you. Yeah. So that's the thing. And it and the advantage of that, it changes your perspective. Again, if you just want to go back to general practice, yeah. you, you worry a little less. Because when you see someone who has to come into hospital overnight for antibiotics, you know, right, that's quite bad. Whereas some fat faces, you just think, oh, they'll be okay with normal antibiotics. Yeah. So again, going back into general practice in the future, it's useful. Um, but you see all sorts. You see lots of big cuts on people's faces that you have to stitch up in A&E. You see dog bites, fat faces, traumas, car crashes, stabbings. Yeah, what was the first one like? Pardon? What was the first one like? Where was that sort of emergency where someone's been slashed or, you know? Yeah, so the first one I saw was a, um, someone who'd fell forward and um, caught the, the forehead on, on basically on the countertop and basically a big cut a goal across the forehead. Yeah. So I'm rocking down after my first week. And then you see this massive cut that lifts up a bit and this elderly person, you just think, how am I going to close this? But you, I suppose the thing that I quite like that maybe other people don't like is a sense of you can just do it. So you go down, numb it up, and then just stitch for about an hour until it's all fixed and back together. And there's not really any support. There is if you want to ring a registrar, but if it's at nine o'clock at night, then they're probably not going to be best pleased if you give them a, a phone call about a cut on the head because they can't do anything. They'll just say you need to stitch it up and you just get on with it. So, so what, that was, sense what, what was your, what would have been the next sort of experience that would have been close to you doing that? So like, what's the jump from, what well, was it just doing stitches on pads? Was that the most that you've done? How was that jump to then doing yeah. So I suppose you go from, I did one stitch at undergrads on like the tooth right at the front, so it was a piece of cake. And then you do the occasional one in foundation. I was in my first dental core training, yeah, I did quite a lot of surgical extractions of teeth. So I was reasonably okay at doing at stitches. So I was all right at that. Stitches in the mouth. In, in the mouth, yeah. In so in a way that prepared me because doing stitches on the inside of the mouth is well more difficult than doing them on the on the outside because you can see what you're doing and, and obviously just get things pulled back together but an important thing to is obviously everything's different when you're closing skin you've got to close it in layers so understanding that is again another learning thing that's important and i think that will by doing a bit of reading beforehand watching youtube videos etc and then after you think you've got it and you do it and then in lots of cases you worry about it so that lady i saw her two weeks down the line i was really worried that i did a really bad job and thankfully she came back and 
she was over the moon with it i was over the moon with it and then right. we we're all happy so it's again you get that self-confidence quite quick which is always good okay so how quickly do you then need to decide on the next step during dental core training so during dct actually when you're in dct1 at what point yeah. do you need to make a decision that you need to apply for dct2 and then um, if you do, by what point do you need to make a decision to apply so, for three or so the applications open january february time i think okay. so it's january february might be into march well the first three months of the year and your application goes in and then april may late april early may is your interview and then you find out end of may june time whether you've got a spot so really you need to start thinking about it um sort of november december sort of time okay so you have started yeah. dct in september yeah so it's pretty quick really and then within pretty- the first two three months you need to have made up your mind about applying to yeah you. i suppose there's always an element you can all the way up to the interview stage you can always withdraw so I think if you're on the fence, then I'd just apply. And then if you think, actually, no, I don't want to go through the interview. It's stressful. I don't want to pick up and move somewhere else. It's stressful. Then mm. you can pull out. So I think if you're on the fence, then apply. It gives you a little bit more breathing space and a little bit of time to think. And then from that, you can decide if you want to do it or not do it. Okay. So what helped you get DCT1 and what helped you get DCT2? So um, with the DCT1, I suppose it's just practicing. It's very similar to your foundation training. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose if you know you're kind of going to go down that the pathway of DCT one and two, always just try and occasionally look at the stuff that leaves your brain really quick. But this is aimed obviously at more the uh, dentist potentially watching this. Is have a quick look at like the professionalism stuff that you'll learn and then forget. Just keep topping that up like throughout the year. If you've got like a spare Wednesday evening that you've not got anything, just there's loads of professionalism stuff on like the indemnity websites like DDU and and places like that. And you can just have a little look and it just keeps refreshing your brain because at dental core training, they tend to probe you a little bit more about, you know, it's not just you blurt it out, you get a tick. They do just probe you a little bit more. Um, And then I suppose for when you're applying for dental core training as well, it wasn't for my application, it wasn't the case, but in previous applications, they asked you about max faxy stuff. Okay. So picking up some of the max facts, you can buy a cheap max fax text, textbooks, like dentists on the ward. Um, if you're really keen, then get them. You can pick them up probably for 20, 30 quid, maybe a bit cheaper off eBay or get them from a local library if you have access. And I think just gives you from dental school would have helped you get dct1 so like the award that you did uh, mm, for Edinburgh, yeah. would things like that have a big impact or not really yeah so for dental core training one not so much because your awards and the extra stuff that you do outside so things like audits um presentations academic posters or presentations etc they come into play when you develop a portfolio Okay. So for that sort of stuff, it's for DCT2, DCT3, and if you want to do a specialist application. Mm-hmm. Um, would a general dentist look at posters and oral presentations? Maybe, but probably not, to be honest. I don't think if I went to a practice principal applying for a job with an academic poster, I don't <laughs> think that would impress them that much. They would probably want to know more what I've done, frankly. Yeah. So... Um, I suppose it's tough. You need to have at dental school, perhaps, maybe think, yeah, it's hard to think, but I think always just try and apply for or try and get involved in like certificates or um, trying to get awards. There's loads of undergraduate awards. You might as well just try it, put in a little bit of effort because eventually it probably will, will help in getting an extra mark in an application. Okay. And as Arnold said, dental core training is really competitive, so any extra marks could get you the job that you want or the job that you don't want. So it's definitely worth it. And then um, specialism now. So yeah. let's say you do want to specialize. Yeah. You know. So what's what what what's, what's the hardest thing about trying to get a post? Um, and are different posts more competitive than others? Yeah. So getting a dental specialist job is competitive end of the well, it is competitive 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 
it, it, it's all yeah. complex. I mean, from from <laughs> trying to go to um, dental foundation training, DCT, it seems like from it's all... School, isn't it? Even getting from dental school, foundation training, everything's just a competition. Yeah. So it's an element of trying to help people out, but also you've got to look out for yourself. Um, I think as well, because it was competitive to get onto DCT1, and the people yeah. that get onto DCT1 are already competitive. And now you're competing against those to get into Yeah, DCT2. I think you, this is what I was saying about the pyramid before. As you get all that pyramid, people are more and more focused on specialist training, really. And when you start to get to that point, you are competing against people who are driven to be specialists. So you have to stand out and have a good application. So... I don't, I don't actually know the numbers for different specialities, but the reason they are so competitive is there's not a lot of, not a lot of posts. Mm. Um, I've applied for restorative speciality training this year, and there's eight jobs across the whole country. So, and that's quite a good year. Like in other years, there's two, there's three. And they tend to be spread across the country. Yeah, so it, different dental hospitals obviously have it now. If they've got the funding to have a post, then they'll do it. So in most cases, they almost like have a year of a, a training, a year off, a year on, year off. So it waxes and wanes, but it's the same across all different dental specialities. Mm. And that's why it's so competitive. It's because you've got lots of people applying for only a limited amount of posts. So what, what, what are they what are they scrutinizing? So they're looking at audits that you have? Yeah, yeah so audits, the quality of audits. Uh, how is yeah. that looked at? So ultimately, I think most dental specialities now are working from a portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, you apply with a portfolio or a self-assessment, and from that they'll decide if you, you've got a interview. And then the interviews are very much similar to dental core training, um, professionalism, knowledge. Uh, there's not usually a situational judgment test though. So really getting your foot in the door is the portfolio. And you get lots of ticks. So you get ticks and marks for academic awards. Um, so the dental skills thing that I did, but undergraduate prizes, postgraduate prizes. So if there's any opportunity, try and get them in. So what what other awards would you apply for after um, university? So you've got loads of foundation training ones. Okay. So all the different, you've got an endodontic um, FD prize, um, Perio FD prize, there's probably a prosthodontic FD prize, and you've got okay. a British Association of Cosmetic Dentistry. Um, there'll be FD um, case presentation awards. There's honestly loads. All the, usually, if you've got one of the different institutions, so for example, the British Association of Prosthetic Dentistry, that's an institution that looks after the prosthodontist, is that they will probably have an award for FDs or mm -hmm. undergrads or recently graduated dentists. So you just need to have a look at them. Okay. Additionally, your schemes tend to have awards as well. So at the Northwest one, there was basically FD of the year. There's stuff like that. So it's kind of just trying to apply. And it's difficult to get one, but even showing that you've applied and been shortlisted, shortlisted for the final award is mm. it's always marks in your favour, really. Okay. Um, so that's awards. You can do postgraduate qualifications. So the most common one is the MFDS or the MJDF. And these are postgrad um, qualifications with Royal College of Surgeons of England. Then there's Glasgow, Edinburgh. Um, so what, what's the purpose of them? So ultimately what it is, is you get go into the faculty of, is it faculty of GDPs? But ultimately what it is, it demonstrates um, commitment to postgraduate dentistry in a way yeah. you continue examinations um and you, you've got a written exam which is it was pretty hard actually the part one and then the second part depending on what college you would do is on an OSCE. so again it's just a further examination to demonstrate one that you want to continue with education and then it also demonstrates that you're at a reasonable level to yeah. continue as well yeah. um and for specialist application, lots of people, well, almost everyone has it. So you need to do it as well, because it's one mark that they all have that you don't have. Another postgrad qualification lots of people do now is um, a postgraduate diploma or PG cert, so a postgraduate certificate in education. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, 
and that's good for sort of postgraduate um, further postgraduate education related to dentistry you can get it done in a reasonable amount of time so you can do them in 12 months or 18 months and then also from an application point of view it does that mean you could also be a, um, a trainer for foundation dentists as well exactly yeah so there's yeah so you've almost got to think everything you do has got to be almost double-edged in a sense if i don't get into specialist training at least i've got a qualification like arnie said that i can be a, a, a trainer in the future for foundation dentists you can go back to dental hospitals and be clinical supervisors um, as well so it's a good thing to have um it's about 18 months to do and it's extra letters after your name so okay. pretty long. All right, so, okay, so what else do we need to do to get competitive for specialist training? Audits. Audits. So, for dental students listening, audits are probably as far away from your brain as possible, um, but if it's something you want to get involved in, for dental students, try and, if you're working in a dental hospital, um, a reasonably big one, try and seek out some dental core trainees and ask if they can do an audit, because as part of found, as part of dental core training you have to do an audit so if a student approached me and said can I help you out in your audit I'd say yeah um, but you can do audits on basically everything and what it is is a quality improvement program so ultimately just try and decide something that you've seen and you think actually we might be able to do that better hmm. then you compare it to a standard that's better and then from that you can improve the practice so you've got to do quite a lot of them and we won't bore about the details about one cycle and two cycles but a decent quality audit um, with two cycles is worth a decent amount of marks so it's a good thing to do okay. and it's expected for dentists going forward as well so it's a good thing to learn and not so, loathe is there anything else that you you yeah sorry Arnie there's loads <laughs> oh really <laughs> I, I yeah. thought we really covered a lot I know I know wow. I time I'm fire through these. The other ones are oral presentations. So lots of different institutions do oral presentations. A lot of them are on case reports. So if you see anything interesting in foundation training or dental core training, you can do a case, um, a present oral presentation. Would you, you can, present it? Uh, so it's usually at a scientific, not scientific meetings, but um, for example, if there's a orthodontic uh, BOS, the British Orthodontic Society, they'll have a national meeting. Okay. Usually. And if you've got done a done a case, and I don't know, like a helped out on an Invisalign case, or or did an orthodontic based case in dental core training, you could go down and present that um, for an oral presentation, and that's a national oral oral presentation, which is good. But you can do regional presentations as well. So if there's a regional audit that you did, you can deliver that um, at a regional audit presentation. All that is just marks. Mm. Um, to show again that you're committed to postgraduate education and improving um, not only your own work but the sort of service around you as well yeah. the other thing that you can do which is reasonably easy to do are academic posters so again you really only start to get introduced to these probably in foundation training no we didn't have to do one in foundation training so dental core training Lots of these are on case reports. You see something interesting, you put it in a big A3 poster, and again, you you don't present them. You basically stick them up at um, national meetings, and then people um, who are interested who will look at them. It's usually for stuff that's interesting, but not interesting enough to do an oral presentation on. And yeah. for dental students listening, again, if you see interest in anything interesting in your undergraduate learning, just ask one of the supervisors. Do you think this will be a poster presentation, or speak to one of the dental core trainees as well? Mm. And I think that's probably everything that you need for speciality training. So there's wow. quite a lot to do. Yes. And then once you get on, would you be starting in, a, in September? Does it follow the yeah. same? Okay. Yeah, so September. So it's depending on your post. Um, there's either three year posts. So um, if you want to do oral surgery, that's three years. If you want to be a specialist in orthodontics, that's three years. And then there's longer posts, which are five years. And there are things like, if you want to be a consultant in um, orthodontics, that's a five-year post. All restorative posts. Oh, right. I didn't know that. that. Yeah, so, so I you, thought, you know, if you did orthodontics, you do the three years, you're a specialist and you're a consultant. But no, no. no. So you're a specialist and then they've got consultants. And to be a consultant in orthodontics, that's another two years. Yeah. Is, so, do you know if there's any advantage being a consultant orthodontist that doesn't work in the NHS? So, prob 
I don't know. I wouldn't like to comment. I wouldn't think so. But then again, if you're a consultant orthodontist, your experience in more complex cases would yeah. be outweigh probably that of uh, the three orthodontist. Three. Yeah, exactly. So and, and, uh, I, I'm trying to avoid the term high street orthodontist, but orthodontists who have their own practice will manage moderately to moderately complex orthodontic cases, um, moderately to high, I suppose. But then orthodontic consultants are probably going to see patients who've got lots going on, so people with clefts, etc., or loads and loads of missing teeth. Mm -hmm. so, so I think I, that's it's restorative that you wanted to uh, apply yeah. for and get into. So what would you do within the three years? What would so, you that's, so what would actually, what would be different to um, those three years to what you've been doing so far in DCT? One so for restorative dentistry, the first thing is if you want to do an NHS funded post, it's five years and you come out as a consultant in restorative dentistry. Mm -hmm. Now, restorative dentistry is composed of three individual parts, prosthodontics, endodontics and periodontics. Okay. Now, if you want to do a three year post and become a specialist in one of them, you can do in almost all cases it's privately funded either part-time or full-time so if you want to be a specialist in endodontics you usually have to pay to pay on do a full-time course and it's, it depends where you're from but it can be like twenty thousand pounds a year uh, nine to five for three years and then come out a specialist mm. so just focusing on your question you know if we go through the nhs pathway i think which i think the majority of people would try to do um, your practice is now limited only to restorative, in the case of restorative dentistry, is only limited to restorative dentistry. So you start to focus on the parts that I mentioned. So you do lots of root canal treatments, um, lots of um, gum treatments, and um, obviously removable or fixed um, prosthodontic works. So caps in teeth, crowns, bridges, yeah. dentures. And usually it's the more complex stuff that's referred in, or it involves patients who, again, are more complex. So, mm. for example, I mentioned the orthodontics before for lots of kiddies with potentially who have missing teeth, then they would see a restorative uh, dentist in a hospital. Yeah. And then the, those, the only other side is that it's probably pretty much completely different to a high street dentist, um, is that you can start to manage patients who suffered with oral cancer and rehabilitate them because lots of people have to lose their teeth because of part of the cancer treatment so you get to fix um, or give them a functional and working set of teeth and uh, well, false teeth really mm. that's the same for every speciality in the sense is once you commit to a speciality you've got to expect that the other stuff dips away for example if you do orthodontics you're not going to do fillings anymore you're not going to take teeth out anymore. You're going to focus your entire practicing career on moving teeth around. So what, what's, so, what's um, got you to the place of making up your mind that you would be happy as a restorative specialist? So the thing that I, that stood out for restorative is whenever I sort of in dental school and foundation and dental core training, the stuff that I enjoyed doing, was the sphere of restorative dentistry i liked doing bridges i like doing crowns I like making dentures enjoy like for example oral surgery side of stuff i like taking teeth out but i wasn't like proud of myself to do it yeah. and then the more i went through the dental core training levels see the more experience of the work that restorative dentists do in a hospital and i thought you know what i'm definitely going to do this yeah. I think the advantage of restorative dentistry as well that is quite broad, I think, compared to other dental specialities. Yeah. Endodontics is, is pretty different to periodontics and making dentures is pretty different to learning how to do gum surgery. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you go down the sphere of, um, you can always go down the sphere of um, placing dental implants and stuff. Yeah. So I enjoy surgery. So there's always that element of doing a little bit of surgery in the future as well so for me in terms of i quite like the idea of being a little bit of a jack of all trades yeah master of none so i think that would be a nice one to do what, what would you say are like the sacrifices that you're having to make to do all of this training and getting to this stage 
So you, you sacrifice not loads, I don't want to emphasize it, but you sacrifice a little bit of social time and free time in the sense that when I come home from work, I'll have to do my audit, I'll have to do this poster presentation. I'm just currently doing a PG cert at the moment. So it's, that's essays. So there's that continued com academic commitment. Um, and then I suppose in dental core training, particularly with max fax jobs, you'll either lose a bit of social time because of your on-call commitments and things. Yeah. So there's that side of that as well. So that's the social side that you probably lose a little bit. It's not a huge amount though. So don't let that put you off. Um, then I suppose the other side is potentially the financial side. Mm -hmm. um, you earn a decent amount. Like I'm not struggling at all. But if you've got mates who are working in general dental practice, they'll definitely earn more than you. So that's another thing that you want to consider as well. What stage of life are you at? Do you want to get that deposit down on your house? Do you want to buy yourself a nice car? So that's does, another does, thing. Does it increase year on year? DCT so, one, DCT two, DCT three? So from, DC, from foundation one, two, and three, your base is about the same. And currently it's okay. about 31. If you work in a max max unit, you get on-call commitments as well. So that tops you pay up an extra 10, 15 grand, depending on where you work and how much you do. Yeah. When you go to DCT3, it bumps your pay up to um, just under 50. Um, and then if you're doing that in a dental hospital, only post with no, so I'll rephrase that. If you're doing a, um, a max fax post, then you will get a top up again. So in DCT3, if you're working in a max fax unit with on-call, you'd be on a decent sub decent sum of money and then so what about again, when you go into the first year of specialty training is, okay. is it, is it no. when you get into specialty training um you, it's set for the whole three or five years really so yeah so it, it changes every year because the nhs uh, wages are going up at the moment fractionally aren't they so it's about 48 49,000, and then that is fixed for the three years it's not like a medical registrar job where it goes up in in cost you're on a set banding for that period of time okay. so for people doing a three-year job it's not too bad because you've got a deferred benefit when you come out of a specialist you've if you poorly considering sort of finances then you've got a deferred benefit because after three or five years you are then a specialist in a field so you could potentially obviously you i don't say your work's better but you've got um, a specialist background so you could potentially if you go down the private sector, you can obviously potentially charge a little bit more. So in a financial deferred benefit from doing speciality training. Gosh. All right. I don't want to because I don't think people should make a decision based on the money. Because we're dense. Right. If you're in right. density, then you're going to be fine. That's right. If you're in density, you'll be fine. You had your reason for getting into dentistry. Yeah. Has that remained the same to this point? Or do you now have a different reason why you enjoy dentistry or being a dentist? Um, I think, I think still fundamentally the stuff that I thought I would enjoy in dentistry, I still do. I, mm. I really like the practical side of stuff. And I think the more I've got progressed through dental school and then through the early stages of my career, the more I've sought out more complicated stuff, the more I've enjoyed it. The more complex things are for me, the more I enjoy it, quite frankly. The harder, the bigger the challenge, the better it is for me, which makes it again sound a bit mental. But I quite like <laughs> it. Does. It I, I want to stay away from it. That's too complicated. <laughs> I, I quite like to go towards that and, and to challenge myself and help people out. Yeah. Uh, I think I was very much set on being a general dentist, which um, definitely maybe because our undergraduate prepared us for that and foundation training. Mm -hmm. um, so I think probably in terms of my career paths changed quite a lot in like two years because I was pretty set on having a nice practice somewhere and doing nice work but now I can see myself probably in a in a, some form of dental hospital or district hospital so I suppose that's the main change and the only reason I've got to that is through experiencing dental core training and yeah. speaking to senior colleagues and getting to speak to colleagues on my level as well and understanding their reasoning to do speciality training so from that side of it anyone in listening who's on the fence i'd just say particularly for dental core training just go for it if you hate it for a year you hate it for a year that's it you're done you don't have to ever do it again yeah. if you love it it could make in my case it's been pretty i would say life-changing because it's a bit cringy isn't it but it's changed my career path quite a lot hopefully yeah. i could still end up in a practice somewhere i suppose all right no thank you for that Stuart, and uh, I'm sure we'll do a part two.
sometime in the future. I'm sure people will have questions and things that they want to know. And beyond a bit by then. Yeah.